Leonard tried to look dignified as he awaited his most likely horrible death. A task he found very difficult considering he was A, tied up in bloody ropes and gagged with an even bloodier cloth, and B, watching as two ogres were eating a disemboweled Moon Clan grot in front of him. When he was previously tied up behind his Moon Clan grot guide and led on one of their raids, he thought he would eventually be trampled by a squid herd or stabbed by another Moon Clan grot while his guide wasn't looking. That was until the horde of grots met the wall of flesh that was the Ogors. Although the grots had numbers, those numbers didn't do much against Ogor might, and the grots broke, the tiny greenskins fleeing in all directions, leaving their dead, their injured, and their one human prisoner. As the two Ogors finished their grot appetizer and turned hungry eyes on Leonard, he heard a loud yell that Leonard knew was in the guttural language of the Ogors, in a voice he swore he recognized. After a brief exchange, and what sounded to Leonard like laughter, he saw the two ogres walk away while a new ogre picked him up from behind and turned him around. Leonard, you end up in the strangest places, don't you? Said Jargren, Frost Lord of the Beast Claw Raiders he had spoken to oh so long ago. Here, let me get that gag out of your mouth. Uh, thank you so much, Leonard said weakly once his gag was removed. I didn't know these were your people. Jargren laughed, amusement clear on his massive face. Sorry to say, Leonard, but that's not the case. My people are temporarily aligned with this war glut of gutbusters, and I have no real authority in this camp. Do you know of the gutbusters, Leonard? Jargren asked. Um, not really. It wasn't really part of my research. Good. It will help pass the time for our walk. Walk? Leonard said worriedly. Yes. To the tyrant's tent. I had to make them a promise in order for them to let you go. But don't worry, it's nothing big. Is this promise why you still haven't untied me from these ropes? You see, Leonard, that's why I like you. You're a smart one. Now come on, let's head over to the tent, and I'll tell you all about the Gutbusters. With that, Jargren started walking towards the center of the Gutbuster camp, still holding one very terrified scholar. Now all ogres like a good meal, and make it a priority to eat as much meat as possible. But the Gutbusters take it to the next level. They worship Gorka Morka as the great gulping god, believing it's their duty to consume flesh of all types in honor of him. And with the forces they have under their command, few armies can stop them. Ogor gluttons make up the bulk of the Gutbuster forces an army of stampeding metal and flesh that roll over and consume anyone in their path. And like most ogors, things like honor, ideals, and all that stuff is useless against them. All they care about is smashing flesh with their weapons, and if they lose their weapons, taking down foes with gulping bites using their teeth. They usually have a war banner of some sort, with a gory remnant of a prized feast or even a loud mouth bellower to issue challenges, or sing some really bawdy songs to inspire the ogres around them. And a group of gluttons is usually led by a crusher with a war club, and occasionally guided by a lookout Noblar, to see if any enemies try to sneak in an arrow attack. Noblars? Leonard stated, his curiosity peaked despite the fear gripping him. Ah yes, Noblars. Fairly common in gutbuster camps, as I recall, Noblars are a sort of distant cousin of Grots who, as far as I can tell, are significantly stupider. They were originally from the realm of metal residing in a place called the Scrappa Spill, a spot in that realm that somehow spews mountains of metal debris from across the realms. Not sure how exactly, maybe a leftover spell from the Age of Myth. Either way, the scrap-loving Noblars loved it there and spent who knows how many centuries playing in their scrap heaps. That was until a tribe of Uroks came in and took over. Noblars being Noblars, ran. The Noblars couldn't survive on their own, so they chose to ally themselves with the Ogors. The agreement was simple. The Noblars would serve the Ogors, and the Ogors would only eat the Noblars if they were really, really hungry. A fair exchange, I think. In a fight, the Noblars can be pretty nasty, 
If they have the numbers, they will envelop the enemy in a screeching horde. And they have a low cunning like rots and love to fight dirty and lay nasty traps. If you want to know how dirty, the leader of a horde of Noblars is called a groin biter. Let that sink in for a bit. Noblars also love to fix scrap. One of their greatest weapons is a scrap launcher. A piece of artillery capable of throwing down a deadly rain of scrap that is pretty lethal. Stuffed with weapons too big for Noblars to use, but too small for Ogors. I was on the receiving end of a scrap launcher blast once. A misfire during a battle. I had a good laugh about it in the end. The Noblars would have too, I'm sure, if they weren't too busy being digested. Heavily armored warriors handpicked by the tyrant himself. Only the most grizzled and rotund members of the tribe who have marched with the tyrant for many decades are chosen to become Iron Guts. If chosen, they must consume a lethal concoction cooked up by the Gut Buster Butchers as a test of their fortitude, usually with something even Ogors have trouble eating. Now although being part of the Iron Guts is a great honor, it's also a place for the Tyrant to keep an eye on his potential rivals. For almost all challenges to the Tyrant's authority come from the Iron Guts. There is no room in Ogre society for sentiment or loyalty, and an ambitious Iron Gut will turn on a weakened Tyrant in a heartbeat. There are many tales of the children of tyrants in the Iron Guts challenging their sire for dominance. The Iron Guts are only used for important positions in a battle, for every Ogor knows that ultimately, it's always down to the Iron Guts to take out the hardest points of resistance. They use mighty bashing weapons to crush the toughest skulls, and one of them is occasionally gifted with a rune maw to help defend against the magic of their enemies. As a general rule, Ogors love explosions. Something about seeing a tide of meat fall from the sky as metal bits go through our enemies makes us tingle, which is why we love black powder weapons. Specifically, cannons. Which is why lead belchers are willing to carry those cannons on them just to see them rip apart enemies in a wide arc. The problem, of course, is getting them to work, as maintenance is left to Noblars, and Ogors aren't as disciplined as, say, an Iron World Arsenal team. As such, mishaps are common, but are considered a small price to pay for a loud boom. Built on a scrap-built chassis and hauled by a Rhinox, Iron Blasters throw massive cannonballs onto ranks of the enemy. It is said that the first cannons used by the Iron Blasters were created by the Sky Titans, used once to defend their Sky Cities from encroaching enemies, cannons that proved useless against the wrath of Gorka Morka. When the city fell, the cannons were filtered down to the Ogor Maw tribes. Most of them were destroyed over centuries and the Iron Blasters you see now are simply lesser versions taken from free cities. But a few Wargluts claim to have Iron Blasters from the Age of Myth. If true, then their hail shot and cannonballs are much more lethal than regular Iron Blasters. Those Sky Titans knew how to make explosive weapons. I wonder what they tasted like. There is no worse fate than being unable to eat a good meal, and the victims of the Empty Belly Curse, the Gorgers, are cursed with that fate. No one knows for sure why they gained this curse, but the result is that food tastes like ash and worse, the former Ogors are unable to grow a proper belly. This of course drives them insane. They are kept away from the warglut in lightless underground lairs and filth strewn warrens, and the only ones allowed to go near them and feed them are the butchers. In battle they are used as shock troops and ambushing hunters, their long claws and snake like jaws ideal for such duties and their insatiable hunger makes them as crazy as any berserker warrior. Although all gut busters follow the tyrant, everyone respects the butcher. Butchers are the spiritual leaders of the gut busters, the link between the war glut and the gulping god, making them the tribe's prophets and in battle the tribe's wizards. They are chosen at a young age. How they are chosen depends on the tribe. Once chosen, they are apprenticed to a butcher and learn the art of gastromancy, learning the proper combination of meat to cast spells and divine the will of their god. Their duty is twofold. They guide the tribes to the best places to gain meat, and once they get there, cook that meat for the tribe. A duty so important that if the butcher said to head out, the ogres would do so in a heartbeat. In battle, they usually wield their tenderizers and cleavers as weapons, and although lethal, their main strength is their spells, and their spells are many. Blood Gruel which can heal Ogors, the voracious maw spell that creates a giant maw to eat our foes, and they can even send people into a healthy amount of bloodlust. 
Sometimes a butcher is overwhelmed by the power of the Great Ma and becomes a slaughter master. They chop off their own arms and replace them with blades to chop up meat faster. They are also known to grow to obscene proportions due to their enhanced links to the Goping God. They order nearby Nablars to chain a cauldron on their back and once done, run through the battlefield cutting off limbs and heads with abandon. As the slaughter master charges through the enemy, the Nablars grab any bits of flying meat they can and put in the cauldron. The dishes the slaughter masters create are only fit for themselves and the tyrant they serve, and any ogre who tries to sneak a bite find themselves quickly added to the pot. Like the Uruks, gutbusters tend to follow the strongest and girthiest ogres around, but it's not instinctual like the greenskins. The gutbusters just know that the biggest ogre will most likely help them get the most food, and if he doesn't, well, the tribe will eat him real quick. Of course, staying the big boss isn't easy, and the tyrant must always prove they are a bully of the first degree. Disputes for leadership are constant for the tyrant, and they are always handled the same way. A one-on-one -on -one fight between the tyrant and the challenger. To the loser goes a shameful disemboweling and an unpleasant death. To the victor goes a rather satisfying meal. This constant fighting also ensures the tyrant is always in top shape. And particularly gifted tyrants soon gain a title that almost becomes a part of their identity. For example, Balrock the Filthy swore he would never touch water again after a particularly harrowing fight with the Idonef Deepkin. I saw him trying to cross a river once. I was smart enough not to laugh, but it took all of my willpower not to crack a smile. In battle, they can usually be seen with a thunder mace to send enemies crashing away in a shock wave, a beastier glaive to disembowel larger enemies, or even ogre pistols to shoot someone in the face. Now there are other ogors that are more hangers on than part of the gutbusters, like the magical fire bellies, or the mercenary man eaters, but I won't get into them today. We are almost to your gift after all. Gift? Leonard said surprise as Jargren put him down and quickly removed the ropes binding him. Yep. Jargren said simply before shoving Leonard into a large tent. Inside were over a dozen standing ogors, the biggest Leonard had ever seen, and sitting on a massive wooden throne. At the opposite side of the entrance was someone who could only have been the tyrant, the biggest ogor in the room, and wearing a crown made of human bones. In the center of this tent was a ogre wearing a butcher's apron and holding a large bowl. As Leonard was pushed forward, he saw the bowl's contents and tried his best not to vomit. Inside was the dismembered body of a Moon Clan grot, the same grot that had dragged Leonard behind its massive squig during his march with the Gloomspite Gits. Like I said, Leonard, a gift, Jargren said with a deep smile. Nothing better than a bit of revenge eating. It's usually really satisfying to see your enemy broken down into digestible chunks, and it's even more fun to see another race partake in such a time-honored tradition. Get to it, Leonard. You wouldn't want to disappoint the tyrant. With that, Leonard slowly put his hand into the bowl and grabbed a chunk of quivering grot flesh. And as the ogres cheered, Leonard stuffed the bloody mess into his mouth and began to chew. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Gutbusters. If you like it, please like, subscribe, comment, press the little bell, you know, whenever I post, etc, etc. But if you really like it, please consider giving to my Patreon or give a little to my Ko-fi account. The extra money gives me the time I need to work on these stories I love. Anyway, thanks for listening, slash watching, and see you next time.